There was a very curious story printed in the Saturday, April 15th, 1882 edition of the Dundee Evening Telegraph. It was a story from a man named Mike Doyle, and based on his retelling of an experience he had one night in 1848. The place was Wexford on Ireland's southeast coast, and the venue was the house of the recently deceased Biddy Blake, where the friends and family of the dead man had gathered for his wake. And it was quite an occasion, according to the article as it set the scene. There were lashings of snuff, whiskey, bacon rashes and tea, and no end of fun till all hours. All the Connors, and the Mulvies, and the Murphys, and the Keos, and the Bryans, and Miss Brady the schoolteacher, and the lame Pat Hooligan with his concertina. Pat played and all the ladies and gentlemen danced, and then when we all sat down we had a fine supper. It was late into the night when the party settled and shared their stories of ghosts and the occult. Swept away with excitement, one member of the group, a man named Thady O'Connor, called for volunteers to join him on a late night ghost hunting vigil to nearby Ferry Carrick Castle. There's the old castle up on the hill which everyone says is haunted, he said. I'm going now. The 15th century square tower was across a then wooden bridge, which spans the River Slaney. Most of the party voted to remain in the warmth of the house, and had no interest in venturing out into the cold night on such a foolish errand. The only men who agreed to join Thady O'Connor was our original storyteller Mike Doyle, and their friend Tim Keogh. All three men grabbed their coats and hats and disappeared into the night. As they strolled onto the bridge, they could hear the sound of salmon occasionally jumping out of the water beneath them, before the old castle remains along with the first light of dawn came into view. As Doyle, O'Connor and Keogh now stood at the foot of the tower, they all heard a shrill scream, and there, on the hill that sloped from the castle to the River Slaney, was the clear figure of a woman. She screamed again, and with her arms flailing, ran down the hill, and threw herself into the river, hitting and bouncing off a rock ridge before entering the dark water. The men stood in silent disbelief at what they had witnessed, before gathering their thoughts and solemnly returning to Biddy Blake's house. Mike Doyle tells us that as they stepped over the threshold of the doorway, a storm of thunder, lightning and rain, unlike any they had witnessed before, commenced. When they sat down and relayed to the party what they had witnessed, the story was met with groans and mockery from the crowd. Pouring themselves another drink, Doyle, O'Connor and Keogh privately discussed the events of that night. As the men recalled the horror in the screams of the woman at the tower, the storm raged on outside, and it didn't abate until late into the morning. Six months after that night, Thady O'Connor passed away, and a year after that so did Tim Keogh, who drowned in the Irish Sea. There's nothing at all to suggest that the deaths of O'Connor and Keogh had anything to do with what they had witnessed, but as a postscript to his story, the surviving Mike Doyle said, So there's ghost seeing for you, and moreover no good can ever come of it. So mind and take my advice, young people. Leave the old castle alone. This next story was relayed in 1914 by a Mr. T.J. Westrop, and was told to him in the late 19th century by a relative of his, Reverend Thomas Westrop. The Reverend had recently been appointed to his new parish, just outside the city of Limerick, and had spent some time looking for a suitable house for his family. The house he eventually settled on had been empty for some time, but were told that it was well looked after as the wealthy landlord had employed a housekeeper to make sure the place remained tenant-worthy throughout its vacancy. Reverend Westrop and his family, which included two young daughters, moved into their new home. While walking the corridors they found that one of the rooms in the upper part of the house was locked. No key was supplied for that particular room, and no explanation was given before moving in as to why they had no access. According to the Reverend, as the family's first night drew in, he was upstairs on the landing when he heard the sudden sound of footsteps and the sway of what sounded like a dress or some other material brushing against the wooden floor. He turned to see a woman pass by him. She stepped up to the locked door opposite the stairs, entered the room and closed the door behind her. Westrop followed the woman, but unable to open the door as she had, he became frightened and perplexed. The following day, unable to contact the owner of the house, he called upon a carpenter for help. The carpenter, along with another man, forced the door open. 
As they did, a mass of disturbed cobwebs fell from above the door. The room was completely void of furniture, and the floor and windows were thick with dust. Their attention was then drawn to a small bird fluttering about the ceiling, before exiting the room and flying out of an open window on the landing. Underwhelmed by the contents of the mystery room, the men turned away, but the events of the previous night, the apparition of the woman which the Reverend had kept to himself, lay heavily on his mind. Every night thereafter the family heard noises coming from the once locked room, clear loud noises of someone or something moving around in there, and more specifically, noises from the floorboards, sounds of banging and splintering as if they were being forced up. For many nights the sounds persisted, until out of the frustration and fear it had caused his family, the Reverend had the floorboards taken up. There beneath the boards was the small skeleton of a child. The remains were said to be so old that the local coroner deemed it unnecessary to hold an inquest, and the remains were buried in the cemetery of the Reverend's newly appointed church. The experiences within that house had affected the family so badly that they left the house immediately. Ballygally Castle in Northern Ireland is well known for its ghost stories many of which date back decades and even centuries. The best known is the story of Lady Isabella Shaw, although this reported incident is not so well known, and for good reason. It's brief, and the events could be described as anticlimactic, but it is a relatively modern recollection, and that's why I've decided to include it here. One day in late November of 2000, experienced journalist and filmmaker Liam Cray paid a visit to the famously haunted Ballygally Castle Hotel. He was there along with camera operator Joanne Jenkins to conduct a television interview for Irish broadcast company RTE with hotel manager Sheila Carr to discuss the reported paranormal phenomena. As the castle's tower bedroom is the most active area of the building, they thought it most fitting to conduct the interview there. The room is said to be haunted by Lady Isabella Shaw, who passed away in the 1600s. They lit candles and dimmed the lights to create a fittingly creepy atmosphere and the interview went without a hitch. It wasn't until the two reporters were about to leave that they realised they probably needed more footage for the cutaway shots. The three of them returned to the tower and lit the candles again. It was then that Joanne Jenkins said that the room temperature suddenly dropped, at which time she said she could see her own breath, but no one else's. The candles, which were burning high, momentarily and in unison dipped to almost nothing, and then simultaneously rekindled to full flame. Liam Cray is an experienced journalist who has reported in many potentially dangerous situations. The events that day, I think, are given best credence when you consider his response. I've been a cynical hard news reporter for years, but this was as real an experience as I've ever had. Following the events involving the RTE reporters, a reporter from the BBC accompanied by a medium made an attempt to contact the spirits of the castle in the same room. The medium claims that, at one point, the spirit of a woman stood beside her. The spirit was described as anxious and repeatedly paced back and forth from the bedroom's window in a state of panic. If you are to believe the medium's account, it fits quite well with the most famous story behind the castle. Legend has it that Lady Isabella Shaw, the wife of James Shaw who originally built the castle in 1625, gave birth to a baby girl, much to her husband's disappointment. He said he wanted a son and heir, so took the child away and locked his wife in the top room of the castle. Her body was found at the foot of the tower some time afterwards. She died either in an attempt to escape, or by deliberately throwing herself to her death. In 1978, a farmer and poet by the name of John Sheehy told of his experiences at Killinon House to the Westmeath Topic, a newspaper founded in 1970. At the time the house had not so long ago been destroyed, but John clearly recalled his time there and the various experiences he had working as a farmhand. Killinon House in Clohan County Westmeath had been owned by a family named Raynell for almost 500 years. John Sheehy, who had worked there for many years, remembered the last surviving member of the family, Richard Raynell, and the warning he heeded before leaving the house when it was sold. 
a bachelor and a man she he described as a cultured and benevolent character of Oxford standard, Richard Raynell had told him that there were apparitions within the house and its grounds, but not to be alarmed. John had been told stories of ghostly horses and riders seen galloping over the estate centuries after the events took place, and local law stated that whenever a member of the Raynell family passed away, other late members of the family were often seen in the house, and in later years within the garden grounds. On one occasion, John was tracking a horse that had strayed to the property's boundary, when he saw a pale orange glow moving slowly through the estate, approximately eight feet from the ground. Mesmerised by the vision, but then momentarily distracted, he turned to see a tall man, well over six foot, standing a short distance away from him. The stranger, who appeared to be equally transfixed by the glowing form, then disappeared. Having already worked there for many years by this point, John Sheehy had considerable knowledge of the estate and its past inhabitants, but could not account for the man's identity. This is just one of the many experiences Sheehy describes, but rather than list the numerous others, I'll concentrate on what I consider to be the most interesting. When the estate was sold, the new owner rented the property to several occupants whose stints in the house were all short-lived. One elderly couple who said they intended to live out their last years there only lasted two weeks. The shortest occupancy was a County Meath family who lasted just one night. The next owner of the house employed an estate manager who called upon John one day asking for assistance. He needed to get into the house to make an urgent phone call he said the owner's car was parked in the forecourt, but there was no answer from within the house. Afraid that the elderly man had fallen ill, both John Sheehy and the estate's manager circled the house in an attempt to find an access point. They were soon joined by a tractor mechanic who was working in the yard. The men approached a side door to the property, and as they stood wondering whether or not to force it open, thudding noises like the sound of a sledgehammer emanated from the other side of the door so loudly that it reverberated around the yard. Stones then began to fall from the roof. This was followed by the sound of smashing glass. Afraid to force entry or wait around any longer, the men departed, the manager having decided to call the police. John Sheehy explains that he returned home and heard nothing more of police involvement, but later that night at 10pm, the estate manager called at his house in an almost hysterical state. He explained to John that he and the mechanic had returned to the house. The noises had stopped, but from one particular room at the top of the house, human cries could easily be heard. John fetched a torch and told his brother that he was going back to Killinon House with the manager and the mechanic in the mechanic's waiting car. John's brother said that he would join them, but as there was no room in the car, he would go on foot. As the three men drove the winding road to the house, they saw it in the distance silhouetted against the night sky, and were relieved to see that several of the windows were brightly lit. As they turned a corner the house became obstructed by trees for several minutes. When it came into view again, all the windows were in complete darkness. When they arrived at the house the place was silent. A ladder was placed against the window sill of the room where the sounds of the crying had been heard. John Sheehy's brother climbed up and managed to force the window open enough to squeeze himself in. He rushed downstairs and let the others in, and together they searched every corner of the house, but found it to be completely undisturbed. There was also no sign of the owner. The men then went their separate ways, and it must be assumed that they all pondered late into the night about the mystery of Killinon House. The next day John returned. As he approached the house he saw a blue estate parked next to the owner's car, which he recognised as the owner's daughter's. She had seen John approaching and came out of the house to greet him. She then explained that her father had been taken ill at around 3am two mornings ago. He had called for an ambulance and was admitted to the hospital. The hospital contacted her at her home in the west of Ireland. She then joined her father, sitting at his bedside until he died of heart failure. Saddened by his employer's death, John, along with his brother, the estate manager and the mechanic, would never be able to account for the loud thudding the sound of smashing glass, and the cries that emanated from within the house a full day after its owner's departure and eventual death. The house stood completely dormant for a number of years, until in the early 1970s an unexplained fire gutted the property, leaving nothing but a burnt shell. This was eventually cleared away in 1978, 
which was when John Sheehy agreed to tell his story to the Westmeath topic. Mountjoy Square in Dublin lies to the north of the city. It was completed in 1818, having been conceptualised and planned in the late 18th century, and over the years it has been home to some of Ireland's most prominent figures. One Major MacGregor had arrived in Dublin from England in 1871. He had volunteered to watch over the husband of a sick relative at his home in Mountjoy Square. MacGregor had heard stories from the house of poltergeist activity, and the servants there being physically attacked by unseen hands, but being a pragmatic man, Major MacGregor refused to be put off by such stories. During his time there he was often subjected to late nights due to his sick patient requiring a lot of attention, so MacGregor was relieved when, in January of 1872, he began to see the man's health improving. He was finally able to go to bed at a more civilised hour for some much needed rest. Before he did though, he asked the night footman to wake him if he was needed. The Major retired to his room, and it wasn't long before he was asleep. He had not long been sleeping before he was awoken suddenly. Somebody was poking him sharply in the shoulder. Assuming it was the night footman, MacGregor asked what the trouble was. He got no reply, but was again jabbed in the shoulder, this time with more urgency. Out of sheer frustration, MacGregor said testily, can you not speak up, man, and tell me what is wrong? When there was still no reply, the Major turned over and moved his hand, feeling around in the darkness. As he did, he grabbed a fleshy, soft hand. He said he guessed it was a woman's and held onto it, attempting to pull it forward in a futile attempt at getting a closer look at the person in the near-pitch darkness. But the arm would not move, not even slightly. Feeling a little frightened by now, the Major asked who the intruder was, reminding them that it was improper for a woman to be visiting a gentleman in his bedroom at such a late hour. With this, he used his other hand to grasp the wrist and felt a linen cuff. Feeling up the forearm, the Major was shocked to find nothing past the elbow. He was clasping and reaching into a dark, empty space, yet he still felt the clammy skin of the hand resting on his bed. He let go, jumped out of bed, and ran out of the room towards the bedroom of his patient. As he did, he recalled the clock striking two. Striding hastily into the room, he saw that his patient slept soundly. Major MacGregor spent the rest of the night in the chair beside the bed. The next morning, he told the footman about his experience. The footman laughed and said, Oh, that must have been the master's old Aunt Betty. She lived in the upper part of the house and died at a great age 50 years ago. Despite his experience, Major MacGregor explained to Review of Reviews, a monthly illustrated journal founded in the late 19th century and where his story was first printed, that he continued to sleep in that room for months and was never disturbed again. The January 29, 1935 edition of the Belfast Telegraph tells a story of a tall apparition of a woman draped in black. Every 20 years or so, according to the people of Cushendall Village in County Antrim at the time, she had been seen rushing from the direction of Cushendall Beach towards the village close to Shore Street. It appears to have been a well-known tale in the area at the time, with one elderly resident telling the newspaper, It's a ghost right enough, she has been seen on and off for the past 60 years. After the apparition was allegedly seen again in January of 1935, a group of young men held a vigil at the Shore Street end of the village where the sighting was reported. They waited long into the night. The hours passed, but all they heard was the rushing of the wind bellowing in from the Irish Sea. But then one of the men heard the clear sound of nearby footsteps rushing past them along Shore Street. As dark as the night was, the road immediately around them was clear enough in the light of their torches, but they saw nothing. Overcome by fear, they fled the scene and headed back to the village. I couldn't find any more information on this alleged sighting or any before or since. Of course, some of these stories are lost to time as generations pass and people stop talking about them. Another theory, on the other hand, relies on the stone tape theory, and the notion that a ghost will fade away over time like an old recording. So just maybe, this is what happened in the case of the Black Lady of Cushendor. <laughs>